It's the Farmer to Farmer podcast, episode 112, and this is your host, Chris Blanchard. Landis and Stephen Spickerman own and operate Hermit Creek Farm, 15 miles south of Lake Superior in far northern Wisconsin, a challenging place to farm with lots of woods and lots of water. With about 10 acres in vegetables and another six in cover crop, Landis and Stephen sell their produce through a combination of wholesale and a 200-member CSA. We discuss their long, slow, and roundabout journey through homesteading and small-scale production to having Landis full-time on the farm. Landis and Stephen share how they made the decision to acquire new land a few miles from their home farm and the challenges they experienced in making the change from growing on one small piece of land to growing on two very different pieces of farmland with two very different farming systems. Landis and Stephen also share the whys and the hows of expanding to a larger marketplace and how that drove their pursuit of scale. We also dive into how they've expanded their CSA through the expansion of seasons and products rather than raw member numbers. Hermit Creek Farm has also integrated hogs and now sheep into their vegetable and cover crop rotations, and they use native prairie strips for pollinator and biodiversity inoculation in the vegetable fields. Landis and Stephen share details about how they make this work, why it matters to them, and why it matters to the farm overall. The Farmer to Farmer podcast is generously supported by Vermont Compost Company, founded by organic crop growing professionals committed to meeting the need for high quality compost and compost based living soil mixes for certified organic plant production. VermontCompost.com. And by BCS America. BCS two wheel tractors are versatile, maneuverable in tight spaces, lightweight for less compaction, and easy to maintain and repair on the farm. Gear driven and built to last for decades of dependable service. BCSamerica.com. And by you, our listeners, by setting up a small monthly donation at farmer to farmer slash donate, you can be a vital part of reaching and growing the Farmer to Farmer Podcast community. Landis and Steven Spickerman, welcome to the Farmer to Farmer Podcast. It's really good to be here. It's our pleasure. We really have been looking forward to this. We were talking before I hit the record button, and it sounds like we got a really good day to be recording somebody in northern Wisconsin. <laughs> yes, March madness, uh, cold sleep, such a um, cruel month. When you live as far north as we do in the middle of the continent, um, we can have winter. It seems like about seven months out of the year, and today looks like winter. So I think that would be a great place to start, as far north as you guys are in the middle of the continent. Can you kind of give us the lay of the land and situate your farm geographically and, and in time and, and in terms of your marketplace? So uh, we are in northern Wisconsin, about 15 miles from Lake Superior and about 600 feet above the lake. We uh, are in a, a really challenging place for farming. It's a place with a lot of wood and a lot of water. Lake Superior dominates our landscape and it uh, creates weather for us. And we're in a place that was uh, heavily glaciated. So the, the soil change rapidly from um, one little valley to the next little valley. Uh, one place is rock, next place is clay. And so it's a, it's a challenge. It's an area that's very rural. We live within the Shawamigan National Forest. So that's a large area of forest that not a lot of people live in. Towns tend to be small, they tend to be rural, self-sufficient. Um, yeah, that's kind of our, our geographic location. And being mid-continent is also kind of interesting. When you live, we live above 46 degrees latitude. When you live on the coast at 46 degrees, it's pretty temperate. But here in the middle of the continent, above 46 degrees, and it can be, it can be challenging weather-wise. Uh, we just got done with a week of uh, overnight lows below zero, and daytime highs not much above that. A week before that, we were in the 60s, so it's, um, it's a challenging place. Yeah, that's, it's been kind of a, I feel like, an exceptionally crazy spring in Wisconsin. Is, is this out of the norm for your guys' ex- experience? Yes, it's definitely um, been warmer, and we've had spikes in our weather um, all winter, actually. We we get really cold, which is sort of normal, and then it gets, we actually have, we've had three thaws this winter, which is not normal. Um, we do maple sugaring in the spring, and we've actually uh, decided this year not to do it because 
the of the weather. And we can see a little bit of dieback on our maple trees over the years, and um, just feel on shaky ground, you know, as far as prognosis of weather. <laughs> so feeling like you need to give those trees a little bit of a rest this year. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. It was a hard decision to make. We've been making maple syrup for 28 years now, and to take a spring off from that, you know, sort of what was our traditional start of our farming season was a, a big decision. But with the weather the way it's been, we could have started tapping trees over a month ago. And people I know making syrup, the sap hasn't run now in several weeks because it's been so cold and those tap holes only have a certain life. So if we were going to take a year off, this was probably the year to do it. So how many acres is Hermit Creek Farm? I mean, what, and, and I guess, and I'll, and I'll ask, I mean, how many in vegetables and then how many overall are you guys managing? So Hermit Creek Farm is um, 140 total acres. We have two sites, um, our home site, which we originally purchased um, in the 80s and moved here and started farming in 1993. And it's mostly woods, and that's where our sugar bush is and our homestead. Um, and then we own another 60 acres, about two and a half miles away, and that's all ag land. And um, that was purchased about seven years ago with the idea of kind of ramping up. I think when we first looked at farming, we weren't farming, interested in farming, we were interested in homesteading, and and we were were kind of accidental farmers, really, um, coming at it in a long, slow, roundabout way. We really aren't farmers at the (laughs) get-go. Sure, I can jump in. So, Chris, when we kind of got our start, we both grew up rural. Uh, I grew up in northern Illinois, Landis grew up in Florida in rural situations, but not farms. Um, I think both of our families really felt strongly about producing their own food. This is in the 60s and early 70s and sort of that time period. Um, So we both had a lot of experience with um, farm animals, with large vegetable gardens. I had the added experience of growing up working on neighbor farms and also for Green Giant Corporation. And so I had the... uh, got a lot of experience with tractors and with larger scale operations. And then we, we were both interested separately growing up in natural resources and biology and went to school for that. Uh, both found ourselves out West working for natural resource agencies where we met, but both had this inkling of wanting to, as Landis put it, homestead and maybe get back to how our parents were uh, raising us. And that kind of led us here to Wisconsin and um, put us on that original piece of ground, that 80 acres, that when you look at it, uh, wouldn't lend itself really to farming. It was a farm in the 1900s, uh, but it only has about 10 acres of open ground. The rest is woods, 70 acres of woods, which is great for a homestead, but uh, not really great from a, a production farm perspective, especially the vegetable farm. Yeah, we, Stephen and I are competitive gardeners. We we really (laughs) (laughs) can't help but um, grow and then get bigger and race each other. (laughs) Who can do the most? So um, we, you know, we did start out with the idea of um, planting an orchard, um, raising sheep. You know, this piece of land is um, again, as we said, in, within the National Forest, um, Stephen had apprenticed with a small sugar bush operation just before we moved here. It had great sugar bush, um, slick perfect, um, but we wanted to grow our own vegetables. So we, um, just for our home use, and, but of course it just kind of went wild. And um, I guess we can't just grow a vegetable garden. It always kept getting bigger. And literally, we just walked into our local food cooperative, the Schwamigan Food Co-op. And um, I have a friend who was the manager there and asked her if she wanted some vegetables. And at that time, they didn't even have a cooler. Um, They just had a dry bin. It was a tiny little co-op. And she said, yep. And that's kind of how we started. Um, Literally, in 1993, just bring in a carload of produce and 
and then just building, you know, each year kind of incrementally increasing our production. Um, both Steve and I worked off the farm for, um, Stephen still works off the farm full time. And I worked always winters um, for 22 years. So it's been a slow growth for us out. Seven years ago when we purchased that other piece of land, um, I quit my job completely and um, became the full-time farmer. And, uh, you know, when you choose a piece of land for homesteading, you make a ton of mistakes. Like we have no markets at all. We didn't have running water. We still don't have indoor plumbing. We live on solar Um you know, the land is rocky, it's fertile, but it's rocky and rolling. And so I think we learned a lot from our mistakes. And so when we looked for land, we, we tried to do a better job of looking for something that would be conducive to agriculture. And we found this beautiful piece of land with sandy loam soil and great drainage. And um, And it's amazing how much easier things get when you're not kind of plowing through a lot of trouble. <laughs> <laughs> Flat ground and good soil can make can make a mediocre <laughs> farm a good farm in a hurry. It's true. I just watched like our bottom line keep bouncing up. Once in that seven I just met with our farm service uh agency loan officer and we also, at that time, got a couple of small loans from FSA and um, to help with the ramping up. And she's like, you've done a good job, like a building, you know, look at your incremental, you know, and then all of a sudden, boom, boom, boom. It's like a stair step. And it's like, yeah, it's like, no, duh. it's just, uh, it, it just becomes easier when you don't hamstring yourself. So, And now on that new land, then you've got, all of those things like running water, electricity, all those things that, that make life easy here in the 21st century. <laughs> yeah, that, that was part of um, our selection of that land. Besides the fact that it's a great piece of agricultural land is that there's a power line that runs along the road and uh, it was easy to put a well in and easy to build on. So that's been, it's, it's sort of like our Dr. Jekyll, uh, Mr. Hyde kind of farm. We come here to our homestead farm where it's solar panels and as Landis said, we don't have running water in our house. Um, then we go over to the uh, the other piece of property where we have electricity and we can just flip a switch and turn a cooler on or turn a cooler off. You know, we have water. It's uh, and made things a lot easier. It also makes us very much appreciate that. I think, you know, every time we walk in and can open up a cooler and that we don't have to worry about our batteries uh, being discharged by running the cooler too much. Um, it's a revelation in many ways. It's made things a lot easier. I think that said, I don't think we would have changed anything either. We, uh, we certainly uh, enjoyed this uh, homestead farm that we've lived on now for uh, 27 years. Yeah. And just to put that part in perspective, it's like I maybe sounded like I was complaining about it, but we we always get to the end of thinking, you know, those kind of our story and it's like, yeah, but we wouldn't change anything. You know, like last summer we had we were transplanting lettuce, I think, and it was a foggy morning and literally just on the edge of the woods we had a small of uh, of pups and three adult wolves talking to you know, having serenading us, you know, just chorusing back and um, you know, the beauty of that is heart stopping. So, you know, I'll take woods and water and, um, you know, some issues, but <laughs> any day, um, in the end, we wouldn't change it. So. so you guys are still producing at the home farm as well as on your new grade A land. Yes. Yes. Um, so we, and I think this is some of those things listening to podcasts, Farm to Farmer podcast, um, we sort of over the years has evolved. Um, the homestead farm is, we have nine hoop houses on it, plus a greenhouse and um, small uh, tight fields that have not much headland. So it's real hard to turn tractors around and, um, you know, shorter uh, 
field lengths in general. So we've um, kind of downsized that to more of a micro farm, you know, modeling after a lot of the young people that we hear doing urban, you know, on an acre, smaller rows, try to get rid of using the tractor here. Um, you know, two and a half miles away is still a 15 minute tractor drive. So try to do the homestead farm as a micro farm and then our um, ag land as a, you know, kind of row crop, you know, larger landscape, bigger, you know, doing like an acre of potatoes and an acre of beans and um, versus here we're doing like salad greens and herbs and um, trellis tomatoes and things like that. And it's actually helped a lot to kind of separate rather than try to do everything on both. Um, we can have, you know, scheduled work crews at certain days here or there. Um, it just has made a lot better management of the two sites. So that's something I remember seeing on, on a couple of the farms that I worked on early on in my career was using different locations for different kinds of crops. And, you know, oftentimes that was organized around, you know, how close something was to the homestead or how close it was to the marketplace, but also based on what the land was like and, you know, whether it was suitable for putting in an acre of potatoes or whether that was going to be not the highest use of land that was a little more difficult to farm. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And I think the biggest learning curve for me was, you know, there's that old adage about um, the best fertilizer is a farmer's footprint. And so anything close to the house got great treatment, <laughs> you know, was paid attention to, scouted for. And now I have to drive to work, you know, to the other field. And I've had to train myself to, like, not forget that, not not just get caught up in the small farm here and where I live, where I could literally at, you know, six in the morning, walk out with my cup of coffee and look at things and versus sitting in a car and commuting to work. So it takes a while to learn, you know, the two sites and, but it's a better use of tools time, you know, it's way more efficient to have it be two separate farms basically. So, Tell me a little bit about how you actually do, that that high level management of the two different pieces of land because I know when I had rental grand that was two and a half miles away from my home farm it was easy to forget about it now I think a little mm -hmm. bit different you know you guys that's your bigger piece of land your smaller is at home mine was was the reverse but it was I remember that being a real challenge and it was easy for things to get out of control in a hurry when you weren't looking at them every single day how do you make sure that you keep your finger on the pulse of what's going on at both of these distant pieces of property? For me, what I've had to do is, um, and it's been an evolution. So when we started farming is we still approached it very idealistically and um, we've learned to treat it more like a business. And I think the easiest way for me to manage it is um, to just treat it like a job so that like at 8 a.m. I'm over there <laughs> like I you know to show up for work and I you know uh, schedule you know we work till noon and we take a lunch break and you know it's just I've had to like um, you know be very scheduled you know versus I think the first 10 years of here we you know I might feel like starting to work at five in the morning and then I might work to 8 p.m. And um, I, you know, I think just getting it on a schedule has helped. Um, it took a couple of years. I think part of it is, um, and this is mostly Landis. Uh, I've been dragged into this begrudgingly, but Landis is a meticulous record for, and I think keeping those records um, on a day-to-day -day basis, keeping them up to date, has allowed us to create that schedule so we know when we a field needs to get turned over and put into the next crop, when a cover crop needs to get terminated, when we need to be cultivating or doing tillage or transplanting. And because we have those great records, uh, we can create a really tight schedule. We just follow the schedule. Uh, if it's 
time to cultivate. Well, it's time to cultivate. We don't need to necessarily remember to go over and take a look at it. It's just, oh, field A needs to be cultivated in the next two days. The weather window looks good. Somebody goes and does it. And so I think that's a re- really big part of it. And I think it's also just um, that interest level, knowing that uh, that we have it over there and having a really good crew uh, that we can give them their sort of their marching orders. Today you're going to be at our, we call it our Beaverbrook property, our other property. You're going to be there from noon until four, and this is what you're going to do, and that's where they're at. That's what they're doing. So how did you know that you were ready to take on this farm at such an expanded level? I mean, buying 60 acres of ag land, that's not a small purchase. That's not something you just you just do on a whim. That's and And clearly, again, managing... A couple of acres at home, and now all of a sudden managing a lot of acres at a distance from the farm. What? And well, and then you said you quit your job at the same time, Landis. I mean, what? Why? What? What was it that said now's the time? <laughs> That's a really great question. And so, you know, in the in simplest way is, um, you know, we did because we do to keep right records, and we always have. We, we could see a progression of, um, you know, sale receipts and, you know, gross profits. And we were definitely making, um, you know, great progress. But we also felt that we were kind of, um, we were hamstring because we were um, cropping too much our land. We weren't actually giving it good breaks. We were growing cover crops like, rye and buckwheat and but we weren't really doing those what we desired and maybe we'll loop back later talking about because we really want to talk about biodiversity and some of our um, unique cover cropping systems we have over at that ag land but for us it was we were just too tight here and again back to that competitive just wanting to grow bigger it was that we weren't satisfied with a market garden. It just felt like we were bumping into our fence and to trees and to each other. And so that was easy to think about ag land. But the financial end of it, um, I had gone to the Moses Farm Conference and seen um, John Hendrickson, who I think you've interviewed. And he had, in uh, 2005, produced a booklet or a research project. And you may have also been part of that research project, Grower to Grower, creating a livelihood on a fresh market vegetable farm. And it was really eye-opening to me because there seemed to be this middle-sized farm. If you're under three acres, you had low overhead, um, and so your gross profit per acre was high, and you could usually see a, a good income but it would be a supplemental income because there's, you know, biological limitations to how much you can earn on an acre of land or whatever. And then there was over, and I don't remember if it was 20 acres, there was a huge efficiency of you needed less labor to grow the same number of acres. But there was this middle spot of five acres and, you know, five to 15 acres that we were at at this farm, homestead farm, and um, we needed to push through that because we didn't, we asked ourselves, do we want to get smaller? And, um, you know, again, because we're very rural, we have really almost no markets locally. They're very small, and um, and though we have a vibrant, supportive community here. There's still just so many people that are going to buy organic vegetables, um, and So to fill a car and drive an hour or fill a van, it it just, the efficiencies of size and scale um, made more sense for us here, Um, you know, because we knew we would have to market outside of a smaller local area. Um, So anyhow, that research really kind of underlined what we were feeling, which is this weird middle ground where you're just, you have, you're too small to be efficient. You don't have the big, like there's lots of great tools for cultivation for small farms, like cultivation and ground prep, but there's almost no reasonably priced 
small tools for harvesting. You know, um, we just maybe you jump in here, purchase that bean picker, and it's expensive. And that, you know, and that you need to have an acre to pick beans. You can't just pick a bed's worth of beans with it. And you know, go ahead, Stephen, if you want to. I think where Landis is going is we, what we saw was we, we knew we wanted to get bigger and to get bigger, we needed more land. Um, and that's where the new purchase of land came in. And we gave ourselves, I think it was five years to sort of make the transition to, uh, to purchase the tools that we knew we were going to need. And we actually started buying some of the tools before we even needed them. Like we bought our first, uh, transplanter, um, before we really even needed it because we knew it was going to take us a while to to figure out how to use it to its full utilization. But in that way, we were also ready when that land, when we purchased the land, we were able to immediately start production on it. We didn't have to think about, well, okay, now we've got the land, what are we going to do? It was pretty quick um, to map out fields and, and start putting them into a, a, a usable rotation. And I think where Lance was just going, we we're still at that that area of, of building. Um, we just purchased it's uh, actually was getting loaded today in Ohio onto a trailer a uh, pixel bean picker. Um, we've been uh, ramping up our green bean production uh, to keep up with our CSA and with other demands. And we were at a point where we couldn't keep up with picking beans by hand. You could you know a really good um, a really good harvester. Uh, can do about 25 pounds an hour. And that's the first hour and maybe the second hour. But you get into the third hour picking beans, fourth hour picking beans, you know how it is, Chris. Those, uh, those numbers go down. Well aware. And if, you need two or three, <laughs> if you need two or 300 pounds of beans for a delivery, uh, you either need a whole lot of people or you need a bean picker. And so that was a, a purchase we just literally just made. And uh, it'll be kind of exciting to see what that does this summer. Um, I know the uh, our crew is pretty excited about it because of that thought of spending four or five hours in a green bean field bent over a bucket isn't a whole lot of fun. We have this rule, um, or kind of, it's kind of a rule that if we hear five complaints, you know, over, you know, a period of time, or you know, either five different complaints about the same thing, or five complaints about the process that it's time to address that and beans particularly last summer you know it, it hurts people's backs it hurts their knees there's no way to do it standing up and, and uh yeah it just that it that's a really good indication that it's, it's we either need to stop growing beans or we need to just plow through and get the tool that makes it happen so so now you guys had been marketing just locally there. So I, you know, I assume going up to Ashland, Wisconsin, a town of about 8,000 people. And then, and then it sounds like maybe marketing to some of the other smaller communities around you. And then, so then now you guys have jumped outside of that marketplace now, right? Yeah, we, uh, we made the jump about five years ago to Duluth. Duluth is a city of about 90, 95,000 people, maybe 110,000 when you added Superior, Wisconsin, and some of the other outlying communities. And it's a, a city between Duluth and Superior. There are uh, three colleges, two universities and a college. Uh, there's a large medical, a uh, series of medical facilities there. It's a very vibrant community and uh, very food oriented. And so it's about an hour and a half away. We made the jump there, and, and now roughly, I'm going to guess, 50% of all of our sales, maybe more, are in the booth uh, between the uh, CSA sales there, co-op sales, uh, restaurant sales. Um, it's really become a uh, go-to market for us. There's something I heard a, a long ago of a good friend of ours, Lee Stadnick, who was a organic farmer. Uh, he's now retired and is no longer farming. But we always had a um, sort of a rule of thumb that 1% of any given population gets the idea of local fresh food. And that it's very hard to bump above that 1%. And there might be those magic spots like Madison, Wisconsin, where maybe 5% or 10% of the population gets it. 
but those places are far and few between. And so when we start looking at our local population of 1%, that's really not very many people. And so that was, I think, what helped drive us to, uh, to move further on and uh, to go to Duluth. Um, this 1% of 100,000 is a few more people than 1% of 8,000. So, and I think Duluth is um, maybe not quite Madison, but it's a, a little bit more vibrant than our, our very local community is as far as purchase of local food. But to say, not to say that our local community isn't great. Uh, we have a, a wonderful food co-op for the size town that we have with uh, the envy of many other towns and uh, some very active people. But that said, it's still a very tight market. And how far of a drive is it to get to Duluth? And how many days a week are you going there? We're just going one day a week at this point, although that might change soon. Um, And it's just under two hours, one direction. Um, So, you know, it's a four-hour round trip. So it's one of those, um, a lot of, lot of, Things that um, make it, cha- you know, challenging. Like it's an added cost, but it, um, you know, you just sort of, you, you either decide you're going to do, you know, you're going to go full steam ahead and, you know, complete the picture of the farm. Well, I think, I think it's really, you know, you've got to look at your markets and and make decisions. You know, I think in hindsight. Um, if we had thought all of this out 20, 25 years ago, we maybe would have farmed in a different spot if market drove where we wanted to farm at. And in some some ways, it should drive a little bit of those thoughts. Um, but, you know, this is where we're at, so that's where we have to go. Which brings up another thought. It's uh, what I've always called the uh, kind of the dollar rule. And if you think of what, you know, we grow, we mostly grow fresh produce. And USDA says that you should eat about six cups of vegetables a day. Well, if we look at what our local sales are, if everybody ate the way USDA says you should eat, we probably wouldn't have to market more than about 10 miles from our house. There's enough people living here who aren't throwing their own food that we could could probably just market to that. But the real, the sort of the tragedy is most people don't eat the way you probably should eat. Um, even most local, co- most co-ops, if you look at what is spent on local produce, it, I think our co-op is probably under a dollar a day per member household is spent on local food. And, you know, you, you start doing those numbers and there's a lot more that we can be doing as a population in general. Uh, so, so in reality, if people ate the way you probably should eat, which is more fresh food, more local food, we wouldn't have to market that far out of our uh, farms area. You know, I did some number crunching a while back and, and came up with that the average American buys about $43 worth of fresh vegetables a year. If you take the, if you take the grocery store sales and, and then, uh, you know, put that in with the population, that's about what you get. Right. And uh, yep. yeah, I mean, like you said, there's nobody eating six cups of vegetables out there. And if, if you are, you're right. you're a weird vegetable hippie farmer freak. <laughs> you're a CSA you know? member. You're a CSA <laughs> member. Well, and, and even that, if you think about your average CSA box, you know, yep. six cups of vegetables <laughs> per person per day, there, there probably aren't enough vegetables in there to do that, even for a that's CSA true. member. Yeah, that's very correct, uh, Chris. Um, we laugh a lot of our customers are, one complaint we seem to get back from CSA members is we give them too many vegetables and we kind of scratch our heads because I think Landis and I lead about the equivalent of two or maybe three CSA shares a week ourselves, just the two of us. And we wonder what people are eating, but you know, you need a horse of water, but it's kind of hard to get them to drink. Now, how many CSA members do you have now? Um, uh, so last year we had just over 200 um, and this year, our projection is for 250. Um, one, one other strategy we had with our CSA is so we are rural and we don't have, um, a lot, you know, a never ending supply of people. You know, we have to go get them. Um, but we also have a really vibrant food community here. And what we've noticed, we've had, you know, we've had, we've 
this is our 24th year of doing CSA, and we've had a core group of people who've been with us 24 years, and some almost that long. And so what our strategy has been to go deeper, so we don't have just the traditional um, 18 week, which is the tradition up here, uh, CSA, we, we actually do 25 consecutive weeks and then um, once a month in the winter. So they are, we do an 11 month season. And then we've over the years just added some neat shares as well with just trying to go with the idea of going deeper into our customers rather than broader because broader was not an option for us we couldn't just get more customers so we had to find ways to keep our customers longer and it made a lot of sense because if you've got that person who's already a local foodie kind of person why not give them more or you know provide more of that so even recently we've started adding dried beans and, um, you know, we're really excited by that because there's something that's shelf stable and, and it's, you know, it, it really takes, once you harvest it and dry it, it, it takes no energy um, to store it really. Um, and for us living off grid, that is something that's always important to us because we're always trying to look for energy savings. So, it's hard to compare, you know, 200 shares, you know, we have they, a lot of those are like, you know, our long year round shares. And I feel really happy that they, um, you know, have stuck with us over the years and very, very satisfied um, with that relationship with them. So, so the dried beans and the, the meat, is that coming from your own farm or are you guys buying that in? It's coming from our own farm, so. We're producing uh, dry beans as part of our rotation, uh, and so they're our own. Uh, we're expanding that part of our operation, in fact. And then uh, we do hogs on pasture uh, as part of our, we actually, the hogs are part of our vegetable rotation. We take vegetable ground out of production for a year, raise pasture that uh, the hogs are rotated on, for about five months, and then they're butchered and gone. Uh, so then they become a shelf-stable product as well. And we've just added sheep to the operation about a year ago. Um, and that isn't in the mix as a part of the CSA share yet, but hopefully this next fall it will be. We will start lambing in the next couple of weeks. And um, we're growing that flock, and uh, we're also going to be using sheep as part of our uh, rotation too so, so yeah those are exciting parts of our of what we're doing and uh the feedback we get back from our customers is it's an important direction for us to go with that i actually think we're at a good spot to take a quick break get a word from our sponsors and then when we come back i do want to talk to you about the cover cropping system that you guys have put in place and how you've got the biodiversity and the the animals all working into that great Perennial support for the Farmer to Farmer podcast is provided by Vermont Compost Company. Vermont Compost potting soils are a really special product. I used Vermont Compost Fort V as a blocking mix and potting soil for over 12 years on my farm, and we grew great transplants with it. I mean, really great transplants year after year after year, and we save time, money, and management hassles compared to mixing our own. At a time in the organic movement when we're seeing more and more companies jumping on the organic bandwagon, Vermont Compost is a reminder of the art and the craft of making a great organic potting soil. One thing I've always appreciated about Vermont Compost is their ability to put out a consistent product year after year. And in something that's subject to as many variables as market farming, it's nice to have something you can count on. VermontCompost.com Perennial support is also provided by BCS America. BCS two-wheel tractors are real farming equipment for real farmers. And with PTO-driven attachments like rototillers, flail mowers, pl rotary plows, power arrows, log splitters, snow throwers, even a utility trailer and a new water transfer pump, you've got the tools you need to get the jobs done across the farm and the homestead. On my own farm, we went through a number of so-called solutions for mowing and tilling before we finally got smart and bought a BCS. Even though we owned a four-wheel tractor to manage our 20 acres of vegetables, the BCS tackled jobs that we simply couldn't do with the larger machine, from mowing steep slopes and around trees to working on our high tunnels. Plus, they're gear-driven for years of dependable service. Check out bcsamerica.com to see the full lineup of tractors and attachments, plus videos of BCS in action. 
All right, and we're back with Landis and Stephen Spickerman from Hermit Creek Farm up in the Shamigan National Forest of northern Wisconsin. I should say extreme northern Wisconsin. You can't get much further north. That's right. <laughs> Before we went on break, you were talking about the the livestock and how you've got them worked into your crop rotations. And you had also mentioned earlier the importance of the, the cover crops in your rotation, especially at your new ground. Can you talk to us about how that works? We, uh, about 10 years ago, started bringing um, hogs into our homestead farm. And um, we actually grow um, pasture for them. So we take a piece of our vegetable ground out of vegetable production, including a buffer strip around their area, and um, intentionally grow strips of, uh, Stephen calls it a succotash mix of I think it's oats and peas and other leftover vegetable seeds we have and just literally plants it and then we let it get up to a certain height and then with using electric fencing, just move them into that and then start the next piece and kind of rotate them, kind of like a spokes of a wheel from there. They have a kind of portable house and so they're just living in this old vegetable ground that now they're eating and pooping and we supplement some of what they get um, greens with um, whole grain and um, they, they're there for that growing season and we don't raise our own sows. We buy in um, wieners and, and then grow them to slaughter size so um, they're there just for that summer. Then that winter um, they, you know that ground is just over winter, usually we try to put a last bit of oats down and get a little green flush just to hold that soil in place and the manure that they've done. And then the next year that um, kind of brought back into production and, you know, part of our food safety and organic certification require us to document kind of what we're growing there, but just for our own, you know, health and safety sake, we grow the next year crops that are harvested from above the ground like sweet corn and usually sweet corn or brassica both of which are heavy feeders and really enjoy that kind of fertile ground now so and we just move that that kind of is part of our rotation one of the things we've done at our over at our other property our beaverbrook property is we've standardized all of our fields there at uh, two and a half acres and we will have, you know, X number of fields in vegetable production. The fields that aren't in vegetable production, and I think this last year that was six acres worth or thereabouts, was in long-term um, legume rotation. What we'll do is we'll take after, our, our hope is after three or four years, depending how the field is playing out, we'll pull that field fully out of vegetable production. We'll put it into a, a cover crop usually overwintered rye or barley that was understown with a mix of several types of alfalfa and two or three uh, different uh, cultivars of clover. So then we'll take the uh, the barley or the winter uh, rye uh, off, use that as mulch, really good high quality weed free mulch um, that we can use all around the farm, never have enough mulch. We then have that, that nice crop of uh, legumes, the alfalfa and the clover coming up underneath it that alfalfa and clover will sit on that field for two or three years. Uh, fixing nitrogen, it also gives us forage for our sheep. We don't take a lot of hay off of it. We'll take, try to take one cutting off of it a year uh, right at bloom time. And so you're getting the blooms for bee forage. You take it off, it, it regrows. You get a second uh, later bloom for bee forage, and then we let that sit for the winter. So we'll get two or three years of, uh, of growth. That last year, and we're this this year we'll be just starting that. The last year that that's in that legume cover, we'll then use electric fence and run sheep on it for the last half of that last year, um, probably eh, August and October. So then it, it's the last phase as it's getting manured by the sheep. It's getting the there's something magic that happens when you put animals on the ground. Um, symbiosis of what goes on in a ruminant gut is um, I think pretty magic. And then um, the plan is then the, that following year it'll be rotated back into our vegetable production. Uh, and that's really our, our long range uh, rotation with cover crops. And we also, um, we still use short-term cover crops like 
oats and winter peas and um, all the other uh, cover crops that are, are in the toolbox, buckwheat, as placeholders and fields that are in active production. But I think the really interesting thing that we're doing that we're excited about is taking ground out of production for longer periods of time, allowing it to rest, allowing it maybe to have some of the, um, the fungal growth that goes on in the soil to return. Uh, when you're in an annual crop system, you really burn that mycorrhizal uh, system out. Uh, you start to replace the fungal system with a bacterial system. So by resting that piece of ground for several years, you can uh, allow it that fungal system to start to reestablish itself. We're, we're very interested to see what that begins to do. You know, the other really kind of exciting thing for me that I get really excited about is when we first purchased that piece of land, it was GMO corn, um, and it was really sterile. And, um, you know, you could walk literally across that field, that 60 acres, and not find a, a single bug even. It, it was just but kind of um, amazing after living on this homestead that never had chemicals on it to just see the difference. And um, the first few years, we, you know, we would start to just slowly see, oh, there's a toad. And, oh, like last, two years ago, it was like our first snake. And last year we had our first bottle lynx nesting and um, a harrier hawk uh, was nesting. And, you know, just watching that, growth and something Stephen has um, implemented about three years ago, these prairie strips that he's, they're like permanent, um, maybe you describe them, Stephen. Sure. Those two and a half acre fields, we separated each of those fields by a 50 foot strip of uh, the polyculture of about 60 native prairie species that we're allowing to grow. And we still use that strip for driving on if we need to, to get to from one side of the field to the other, you know, from one to the other side. And um, we use it as a headland, but that doesn't seem to really bother the species that are growing in there, the, the native prairie plants. And um, it's been about three years that we started instituting putting those in. And the, uh, the amount of pollinators that we're seeing coming out of those, um, we had our best cucurbit crop we've ever had of uh, it was about a two acre field of melons and winter squash. And even though it was a, a very wet year last year for us, um, and typically when we have a wet year with a lot of rain, oh, we were getting rain every two days, every three days, you don't get a lot of good beef light. And so you don't have great pollination and that type of crop. And yet, even with that, we had, because that field was bounded by native prairie plants, that were blooming all summer, the amount of bee activity was just tremendous. And we had unbelievable German or unbelievable pollination in that cucurbit crop. And I'm really convinced that, you know, providing that beneficial insect uh, in pollinator habitat has been a huge benefit. Well, not only that, but like, uh, we've also noticed like, um, so, you know, that, that permanent strip is now a refugia for the fungal activity that we can have in our permanent, you know, or semi-permanent alfalfa crop that we have that, you know, that it becomes an easier inoculant um, into that field. And then like we did a late winter, um, we had a bit of a thaw. And so we did a farm walk over there and, and those prairie strips, had so much more soil, I mean, not soil, uh, snow, snow, yeah, that you could just see they become this trap of, uh, you know, you know, besides if we've messed up our, you know, so for erosional purposes, but just for snow, they become this snow fence. And, you know, there was a ton of old seeds from those prairie flowers on top of the snow. And we were seeing horn lark or were they snow buntings? I can't remember feeding on them, juncos, things like that, which, you know, then provide food to keep them there that might eat weed seeds, say, or, you know, they just become this, huge, um, important, even though we're not, we're taking crop ground out of production, you know, as far as like commercial production, but it becomes this value added piece, you know, to the farm. It's hard to quantify, but it's, you know, it's hugely exciting to see it in action. I always think one of the challenges for 
And, well, and obviously you don't do this just for, the, I mean, you're not, you're not taking ground and putting it in prairie just for the money, but it is one of the things that distinguishes what a lot of us do as local producers and local organic growers, that we're taking very active measures and taking land literally out of production. Uh, we're assuming extra costs to manage that land, but there's no, there's no economic return for doing that. Do you guys do any marketing around the ecosystem services that you're providing in the ways that you've just described? Uh, no. <laughs> Go ahead, Steve. <laughs> well, I should say, I think many of our customers know how we farm, and I think that's important to them. And I think that occasionally can attract, you know, say, CFA members. They're, they're excited about what we're doing. They like to come out on farm tours and see what we're doing, and that's exciting for them. Um, you had the but, NRCS guys out last, you know, summer. I guess we've had we've been approached to do, you know, research projects and things like that. Um, you know, it's also interesting because we are certified organic. We obviously follow the National Organic Program. And uh, it was probably about five or six years ago, I remember being in a workshop at the Moses Conference in La Crosse, and Jeff Moyer from Rodale was, uh, giving the talk, and at that time he was on the uh, the NAP board, and he said that we, as farmers, need to be paying more attention to biodiversity. That it's written into NAP. There's very strong language about biodiversity, and that he suggested at that time that we would start beginning we would be getting asked questions by our uh, certifying agencies about what we were doing for biodiversity. And we've always been working with biodiversity land. This is my background is this ecology and biology of botany uh, from an education point of view. So it was always an interest of ours, but we kind of took that to heart. And it's kind of odd. We still have not been ever asked a question about biodiversity by our a certifying agency. Um, but we're doing the work. You know, it's not says you should be doing it, um, that all organic farms should be doing it. So we've kind of taken that to heart. Um, another interesting thing is um, those strips, we, we've kind of bounded our entire property, the entire 60-acre pro property by either the prairie strips or by uh, tree planting. And we've done that because we're still, that piece of property is surrounded by a uh, GMO dairy farm. And so we have worries with drift and whatnot. And so those have also, you know, those buffers are actively protecting us hopefully from our neighbor. Kind of sad to think that you have to do that in today's world, but, and, and it's not that he's not a good guy. He's actually a, a very good farmer for the type of farming, conventional farming that he does, but it's still something that we have to worry about. And I've always found it interesting that, that he as a farmer can farm right up to the fence line between us and that we then have to take land out of production, a pretty sizable chunk of land when you figure out the acres to protect our investment from what he's doing on his land. And that obviously happens on all organic farms because um, I don't know too many organic farms that are embedded within many acres of other organic farms. And so we all have those issues of what's going on on a neighboring farm and what's going on downstream or upstream, you know, upwind. Yeah, it, it is one of the, the frustrating things about farm law, the way it sits. I mean, you would you would think that people would be responsible for keeping their their pollutants to themselves, but that's clearly not how it works. <laughs> it doesn't work that way. <laughs> no, we have um, received, we did the tree planting over a three-year, it was a equipped grant program, and so we did get some compensation to establish those, um, and that was really helpful. It was a little bit cum cumbersome to work through, um, the NRCS for us, and so the prairie strips we're doing on our own. And I think, I guess, in the end, when I think about it, is but it's just like moving here. I wouldn't do it any other way. It's not that I'm being forced to do this. It's I wish to do this, and I, I hope that you know uh, we are oftentimes in our fields at the same time our neighbor dairy farmer is in his field, um, and and I'm sure he, there's puzzlement sometimes but what i what i maybe it's a little smug of me to think that, that over time he's watching us progress and he 
it feels to me does the same thing over and over again and has to work harder. I know milk prices were down the past year and, you know, he just seems to have to like, he's cutting fence rows now to like farm right up to the fence line. And we're, we're taking land out and kind of like almost tithing and, you know, we're flourishing, we're building new buildings and getting equipment. And it just feels like maybe through example, um, you know, I, I don't, ever think I could ever change the world or even my much of my community but if I can just make my neighbor think a little bit more and all our neighbors I mean they don't shop at our farm or you know they they, they probably think we're weird but I, over time we've watched them be like huh oh what you got there oh that's pretty cool and and um we just dug a pond so part of that original GMO 60 acres was they plowed right through a wetland and we we got some 1920s photos Stephen I don't remember the aerial photo date but it showed a an intermittent stream and a kind of shallow wetland that was now obliterated and um, taken off of uh, soil maps even in the 70s so we've restored that and um, we you know tried to get a you know, NRCS interested, but, you know, they didn't think it was wetland habitat. So we just went ahead and did it. And it's, it's amazing to just watch how that um, having a restored wetland, you know, and it's still kind of raw ground starts adding more habitat to um, that system. And um, yeah, I was curious what our neighbors think, but, you know, not to mention it added about almost a million gallons of uh, irrigation water to the to the system. Yeah, that's not true. not a bad side benefit there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now you mentioned that you're on sandy soil. Is most of your irrigation water coming from surface water, or do you guys also use a well? No, we're all surface water. So it's it's a sandy loam. It's not. It's a it's a pr- pretty good soil. It, it holds uh, moisture really well. We have a um, we're on bedrock here. You can go anywhere it's from 10 to 20 feet down. You're going to hit bedrock, and the bedrock just keeps going. So water is hard to find, and it's at a premium. Uh, we've got we own three wells. Uh, those wells all produce in the one to three gallon a minute range. So there's no way you can run irrigation off of it. We have enough water to wash vegetables, but that's about it. So we've had to rely on surface water. We've now dug two ponds. We have one here on the home farm and then the new pond over on the other property. And we uh, we pray for rain a lot. It's sort of what we have to live with. You know, we've learned to well, be there. Dry land farming. I mean, that's, we've, you know, reduced our tillage and, you know, increased our organic matter. And we do have good, you know, um, good soils in general. and and kind of live, live with that. So We use a lot of mulch. Yeah. Just to, to go back a little bit to the, the process of expanding the farm, what kind of challenges did you guys run into moving from being a, you know, a five-acre farm on the, just on the home place to, to now you know, 10 acres of vegetables and, and a whole bunch of cover crops? Well, um, a lot of systems had to change. So I think we really realized that we had to standardize everything we do. So besides um, we, you know, bought tools, you know, like a water wheel transplanter and, you know, basket weeders and things like that. We standardize our fields. We standardize our bed lengths. We standardize just our um, planting schemes so that everything kind of fit in because up until that time, it was more like what they recommend in the book, go oh, 18 inches apart for this crop and 12 inches apart for that and six inches for that. And we just like, no, we're just, everything's on 12 or 24. We're just, you know, we had to, we had to change our thought. We did soil blocks for years and years and we just went to soil plugs, you know, trays. So we've, it's been, we've had to basically radically change everything. We, we used to, customized our CSA shares and put people's names on them. Now they're all packed the same. And, um, you know, it's a little more 
assembly line. And that's been a hard, you know, again, we started out kind of in an idealistic way of wanting to farm and had to think about farming more of a business, which wasn't hard to do. It just was a change for us. Um, you know, planning to um, where tools are, we didn't, you know, for me, a big shift was I thought having one or two tractors was like a lot. And Stephen was always like, nope, we need more tractors. Nope, we need more tractors. And um, sure enough, we need more tractors. We, <laughs> you know, it's just, you need to have kind of two sets of tools in two places. And, you know, we have coolers in two places. We have wash areas in two places. And, um, yeah. Well, one of the things that, that for me it was a, uh, it was standardization, making sure that, like Landis said, all the fields are the same, the bed lengths are the same, the row spacing is the same. So you can jump from one piece of equipment to another piece of equipment and not have to, to change the setup at all. You know, I think that was huge. Um, I think having a, a, a crew that is uh, willing and able and ready to work and well-trained was really big. It's we don't do, we aren't doing this alone um as much as we like to think that we are uh we really have been blessed over the last decade or more of having some really really great people work with us and, stick and with us you know yeah and so so that's been huge you know you don't and when somebody new comes in onto the crew uh you've got older crew members there who train them in um that's that's been really big I, I think, um, and, and just training ourselves to think of it that way, you know, you, I think people, when they start farming, they like to think of it, you come into it almost with a, sort of a nostalgic, romanticized view. And in reality, a farm is a business and it's not a lot different than any other business. You're producing a product and you, you live and die by that production, and, you know, and so I think getting into the mindset that while we can we can still be a very uh, idyllic place, that we are really a business, and that there are, you know, you've got production schedules, and you've got to have so many units come out of a space if you're going to be successful. And I think thinking it like that was a really big part of it coming to that to grips with that. Stephen, you mentioned the importance of those long-term employees. I know that's a really hard thing to do on a vegetable farm, and you guys have a pretty limited growing season up there. How have you managed to get people to stay year after year after year? Part of it is we pay well. We don't look at our, I think a lot of farms use employees as interns and as an educational experience. And right from the get go, we decided that our employees were employees, that we will pay them a, a good wage. It's not the best wage. They can make more elsewhere probably. But for this area, it's a it's a good wage, um, and that in return they come and they work hard, and so I think that's part of it. I think we we're lucky that we have a, a small liberal arts college in Ashland, which produces a lot of our employees. Uh, they arrive and usually they aren't working for us as students. They may spend one their junior senior year with us, but then they stick around the area and they want to learn how to farm. And so they work for us for two, three, four more years, which is really important to get that longevity out of people. And I think, you know, as we move forward, employees are hard to find. It's not an easy thing. And, um, and a little bit of it's been luck. And I think a little bit of it has been the way we treat our employees. We treat them as uh, equal. They're as important to the farm as we are. And they know that. And I think that, you know, that empowers them a little bit. And I think that's important to, to empower your employees, to give them some ability to, uh, you know, to stretch their legs a little bit on your own farm. Well, I think also you, yeah. we've learned to kind of connect the dots. I think the most, probably they come, the first moment they come on the farm, they're very enthusiastic and, um, you know, they're going to farm and it, it's so exciting for them. And then you give them this lecture about 
nope, we're producing product and like we got to do it so many units per hour. And, you know, and it's kind of a, a shocking, you know, to the, to their system, to their idea, you know, and then you have to kind of reconnect that, that enthusiasm again. Oh, but remember you're, feeding people, you're, you're making people healthy. It's really important. You know, you, you gotta, you know, you do have to tell them they no. you actually have to work hard and produce a unit so much per hour. Cause you know, for them, they get an hourly wage, but I don't, don't get paid, but by the piece. So it's important that you help me stay in business, but then You know, you try to keep over, you know, we work with them. They literally, we do everything with them. We don't, we're not top down. We're, we're kind of all on the same level. Um, So they see us dirty and sweaty and tired. And then you connect again, the like reason why you're growing food, like why this is important to remember these things and to, you know, if it, if that knowledge is gone, it's gone forever. And, you know, and then, you know, because you're working, you often have great conversations. And I think if you can connect, reconnect them to why they originally had that impulse, they fall in love with it again. And um, I, yeah, I think that is what's really important. We're, we've been lucky. So. Now, Landis, you mentioned, you know, you get paid according to how well the farm produces. Are you making a full-time living on the farm now? Um, I'm earning a full-time wage for myself, um, but we, so Stephen works still full-time off the farm. And so he earns, he kind of is our, our health insurance and our retirement fund. I, you know, I'm a contributing factor to the farm. We've been, um, I, I think it was a choice um, to do it that way because we've been building equity in our farm. Uh, it, it would be hard to do both. It would be hard to live and we raised a child, you know, and to, to pay all the normal off of this farm and to build buildings and buy equipment and put up fencing and dig wells and ponds and things like that. So we, we made a choice to, um, we would both work um, and contribute to the household. Um, so our farm doesn't quite yet sustain us that way. And that's a real, it's a heartbreaker in a way. I wish, um, you know, I think you said before this, um, that the model of working and living completely from the farm probably never existed or rarely existed, that it was more somebody was a farmer and somebody worked, whether it was in the grocery store in town or whatever it was, you know, and that's kind of how we been doing it. So. If I could jump in real quick, Chris, with what Landis just said, where I grew up in northern Illinois, our small homestead farm was surrounded by, by you know, prototypical northern Illinois farms of the 60s and 70s, uh, small dairies, row crop, that type of thing. And when I think about it, just about every one of those farms, even back in the 60s, somebody worked off the farm. Um, Usually the wife would have a part-time job in town, but sometimes I know the farm just north of, north of our farm, the farmer, Harold, he worked the night shift at a Chrysler plant. And then he came home in the daytime and farmed and he ran about a 40 cow dairy. And I look back at that and wonder exactly how he did that. But I think, yeah, like Landis, like Landis just said, it's probably always really been the model that that idea that you're going to make all of your livelihood off of your farm, it doesn't happen that often. Uh, it can happen. I, I know farmers here in this area, dairy farmers who are both uh, husband and wife are working on the dairy farm, but I also know that they struggle. So it was, for us, it was a conscious choice. I'm at a point in my career, I work for the U.S. Forest Service. I have for pretty much ever since college. It would be a hard decision to leave that career right now to work on the farm, in part because I still work five days, six days a week on the farm. It's just at a little bit different schedule, not quite as many hours as I would if I was here full time. But to, uh, you know, in today's reality of health insurance and whatnot, having that job off the farm has been, it's been huge for us. 
And Landis is also, quite honestly, uh, the better farmer. She's the true farmer, and I'm, I've got the strong back, and uh, I know how to work on the. <laughs> I, I know how to fix tractors. <laughs> uh, that's not really true. We're we are a good team, <laughs> for sure. One of the things that you guys put right on the front page of your website is the words "quality of life" and how important that is to you. And and I'm hearing what you're talking about going through this expansion, raising kids having an off-farm job and still coming home and farming. How do you guys make all of that work? That's a good question. Uh, you know, I, I, I'm going to jump in real quick, to, and you, you can finish it, Stephen, but, um, you know, when I think about it, we have an obsession with farming. With, with we were really plain spoken about it. Is we there, we can't help ourselves. Like when I was six years old, I kind of browbeated my dad into giving me part of his garden. And Stephen has similar stories. It's like we can't help ourselves and that our favorite thing to do is actually grow things. And so um, we oftentimes, like we used to do farmer's market and every week people would tell us, oh, you work so hard. And it just kind of doesn't compute to me. I mean, there are definitely times where I need to take a break from thinking about farming. I stress about, I worry about the weather and I worry about sales. And But but the actual growing of things is, I'm so happy when I do it. And I think, you know, that though I have to sometimes do paperwork or sometimes I, you know, have to do deliveries or stress because of, it's dry or too wet, um, you know, I don't. I don't, that's, you know, not a problem to me. And I don't know how that would translate to other people, but I do feel like farming has to be kind of a lifestyle choice. I don't think it's easy to turn it into a nine to five job that, um, because you're dealing with weather and biological systems. And so I don't think you can just be done at four if, if it's about to rain or if it hasn't rained, like, or if the animals are, it's a lightning storm and the animals are scared and carrying around, like you have to, you have to understand it's a lifestyle. And yeah, I think Landis said it pretty well. I think for us too, quality of life is in part where we live. And that comes all the way back to the very beginning of, you know, the, the place that we chose to farm and that story Landis told about, transplanting lettuce and having a family of wolves, a pack of wolves, literally at the end of the field, serenading the crew as they were transplanting. Is That's for us our part of our quality of life. I took our three border collies for a walk this morning, and I walked out to the end of the driveway, took a right, and I was on National Forest. And I spent a half an hour walking down a, a road that literally nobody's driven on in the past week. Uh, within a national forest, you know, sort of like living in a vacation sometimes. And it's a vacation where we work hard, uh, but I think we would be doing that anyways. When I wake up on Sunday morning, my first impulse is to grab the Sunday paper and snuggle into uh, an easy chair. My first impulse is to go take a walk on the farm and see what happened overnight. And that probably leads to the second thing, which is to, to you know, close the gate that was left open. And then the next thing you know, you're you're doing stuff. And I think it's, it's that's a big part of our quality of life. And I think it's just um, who we are and what we do. Um, but it's important. It's, there are things that we think about. And we, for a long time, we taught uh, within the Farm Beginnings context, um, the program through Animal Pharma Association in Minnesota, and one of the things that we always told students of that program was to have an exit strategy. Somewhere in the back of your mind, you know, have a way to get out if it's not working for you. And we've had frank conversations, and both Landis and I are we're in our 50s. You know, at some point in time, we may not be on the farm. So what is that exit strategy? I think having those uh, honest conversations is part of maintaining quality of life. It, it gives you, you know, you're thinking about it. It's uh, something that's there and you've got to think about. And it, I think it helps you along the way. And then just enjoying what you're doing. Um, I honestly can think of uh, no better way to spend a summer afternoon than raking hay. Probably my favorite thing is the first 
job I did on a farm was uh, raking hay and still probably my favorite job. And so when I think of quality of life, that's what I think about. With that, we're going to turn to our lightning round and we're going to get a word from a sponsor before we do that. And then we'll be right back. This week, the lightning round and the Farmer to Farmer podcast is brought to you by you, our listeners. And the nice thing about that is I don't need to go on and on about it because the fact that you're here probably means you already think that the Farmer to Farmer podcast is kind of cool. I've heard from hundreds of you that that's the case. And today I'm asking for your support. Specifically, I'm asking you to go to farmer to farmer podcast.com slash donate and sign up to provide monthly support for the show. If you'll kick in a buck a show, I'll send you a very cool and very purple farmer to farmer podcast sticker for your water bottle as an extra way to say thanks. All right, Landis, what's your favorite tool on the farm? Well, I would say probably the water wheel transplanter. And I say that because um, it, it was a paradigm shift when we purchased that. It's, for one thing, everybody who comes on the farm, every employee, every volunteer, every whoever wants to ride it. It's kind of cool. It's like you feel like you're farming um, when you're on it. And uh, But for me, it, it, it was when I stopped being a gardener and kind of started thinking production. You know, it, it forces, you know, whoever sits on it, you have to keep up with the tractor pace, you know, so everything's planted with regularity and same spacing and it just shifted. It, all of a sudden it was like, it was like learning about Santa Claus, you know, like, oh, Santa Claus, not real. You mean the Easter Bunny? It's the same. It's just like, ah, uh, I, I that now have to think about row covers should all be the same and fields should all be the same and, you know, just standardization. And so I just really liked that. Cool. Awesome. And Stephen, your favorite tool on the farm? Well, I just mentioned a uh, paradigm shift. So my tool changes a lot. I like whatever tool at the time has created a paradigm shift. So, you know, we've gotten used to doing things one way. Uh, I go to the Moses conference and I hear Steve Pincus say what his favorite tool is. I go out and get one of those, and suddenly, yeah, that's my favorite tool. Well, that was a few tools that'll go. So each year it's something new. Um, this year we're adding a second cultivating tractor onto the farm, and we'll be belly mounting a press finger weeder under that. We've had that finger weeder for a couple of years, but I've been having to pull one implement off of our cultivating tractor and put that on and then back and forth. And this will, so I think this year it'll be the uh, new cultivating tractor and that finger weeder. Um, who knows what it'll be next year? I'm sure there'll be something. Um, I'm kind of tool centric, so uh, you can never have enough tools. So Stephen, what's Landis's farming superpower? <laughs> that's, a, that's a great question. Um, I think her farming superpower is her unbelievable attention to detail. She remembers things that um, I don't know where they come from, but uh, it's, it's, uh, incredible. I mean, she can tell you um, how many seedlings she started so far and probably how many she started last year and the year before that. Um, and we do around 150,000 transplants out of our greenhouse a year. And she, she has a, a uh, clipboard right on the door going into the greenhouse that tells her how many seedlings she's at. And uh, that, that attention to detail uh, is really her superpower. And Landis, I'll ask the same question of you about Stephen. What's Stephen's farming superpower? Um, his humor. He is the funniest guy, and he does the most ridiculous things that gets the whole crew laughing. And um, they created one time a whole video of me returning. They had gotten a job done, him and the crew, and I was picking broccoli at the other place and bringing the band full. And he created a whole video of them waiting for me to re return and it was hilarious and and uh it, i think he <laughs> makes everybody laugh and and uh, laughter is the best medicine so <laughs> my favorite joke on the farm is when we have a, a some new people on the transplanter we're we're using a tractor with a, a creeper gear on it but they still you know those when you're brand new on the transplanter any speed is too fast 
and I love to uh, at some point jump off the tractor and walk back and walk alongside them and then ask them how they're doing and they usually look up, up at me and then they realize, <laughs> aren't you driving? <laughs> but it's moving so slow that, you know, the, the 15 feet it went down the road and it didn't get off the road too bad. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Landis, what's your favorite crop to grow? Well, um, so I really like the unsung heroes and I think that and the onion is the most undervalued vegetable. If you think about it, um, at least in my household, nobody gets excited at the farmer's market. They're all like, oh, the first tomato and oh, the first strawberry. But when I bring onions to the market, nobody even says anything. And yet in my household, we cook with onions every day. I think we eat an onion every day. And they're the most... Um, when you cook them down and caramelize them, um, they're so sweet and so rich and tasty. And if you don't mind, I just have one story about a lucky man who, for whom the um, undervalued vegetables turned to solid gold. And here's the story as I was told that the farmer who grew acres and acres of onions became weary of trying to sell his onions at home. So he filled a carriage with bags of them and struck out to seek his fortune. After much journeying, he reached a country where onions were unknown, and when he demonstrated their wonders to the royal court, the king rewarded the farmer by filling all his onion bags with gold. And the farmer returned home and told his story. So his neighbor, a garlic farmer, took the same journey to the same land. The court was again bewitched, this time by garlic, and the night after a great feast where garlic soup got the pulses quickened and garlic chicken drove people to ecstasy, the garlic farmer was rewarded because garlic sacks filled to brimming with treasure. The man drove straight back to his native land, aching to see his riches. And when he finally arrived, he opened his bulging bags to find them full of the kingdom's most prized possession, onions. <laughs> 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 That's why I like onions. <laughs> and Stephen, how about you? Your favorite crop to grow? Sort of like the paradigm shift with tools. I, it, it changes. Um, right now, my favorite crop is a, a cover crop called Phasalia. It's a, a native uh, plant to the western U.S. that um, I don't think has been grown a lot in North America as an agricultural crop, but it's very popular in Europe mostly for, as a bee forage. Um, we started playing around with that about three years ago, just in some small trials. And I was sometimes um, I was putting out meter quadrats and finding 30 and 40 bumblebees of four, five, six species all within a single meter. And it was as if the entire planting was moving with bees. Um, and so we've been growing that wider and uh, more of it. And what's really great about it is it's in a, when you start thinking about um, crop rotation, it's in a family that we grow no other plants in, in the forage family. And we're not growing any other forage crops. So it's, um, it's you know, as far as the cover crop, it, it's a, a really good uh, ground smothering cover. It has an unbelievable, unbelievably beautiful flower that's really attractive to pollinators. And we can use it in rotation because it doesn't uh, bump up against any other family that we grow. But right now, that's my favorite. And, Stephen, would you spell Cecilia? Sure. Sure. It's P-H-A-C-E-L-I-A. Ah, in other words, I was completely mispronouncing it. It's Phacelia. Okay. <laughs> great. <laughs> yeah, it's a great, it, it's a really great one. Um, and um, it's becoming more available. I'm starting to see it in more catalogs now. Um, so I think people are starting to catch on, but it's been widely grown in Europe for some reason, even though it's a native North American plant. Yeah. Stephen, if you could go back in time and tell your beginning farmer self one thing, what would it be? Oh boy. Um, I would probably tell my beginning farmer self to just keep moving forward, um, uh, to, uh, to, Keep positive and um, to you know don't sweat the details too much. Um, 
where Landis is incredibly detail oriented, I tend to be more big picture, and I think I would keep keep myself doing that. Um, I would probably also tell myself that I need to, to probably uh, a little bit more often than I do uh, right now take a week off in October and go to the Boundary Waters. Uh, I, I try to do that, but I don't always get there, and I would probably tell myself, you know, you need to make sure you plan that a little bit better. And Landis, how about you? If you could go back in time and talk to your beginning farmer self, what would you tell her? Um, I would tell her, beware the shotgun effect. And what I mean by that is kind of um, starting too many things all at once kind of scatters your effort. Landis and Stephen, thank you so much for joining me on the Farmer to Farmer podcast today. Thank you, Chris. This has really been a delight. It's been a pleasure, Chris. All right. So wrapping things up here, I'll say again that this is episode 112 of the Farmer to Farmer podcast. And you can find the notes for this show at farmertofarmerpodcast.com by looking on the episodes page or just searching for Spickerman. That's S-P-I-C-K-E-R-M-A-N. The transcript for this episode is brought to you by Earth Tools, offering the most complete selection of walk behind farming equipment and high quality garden tools in North America. And by Growing for Market, where you can get 20% off your subscription with the code podcast at checkout. Additional funding for transcripts is provided by North Central SARE, providing grants and education to advance innovations in sustainable agriculture. You can get the show notes for every Farmer to Farmer podcast in your inbox by signing up for my email newsletter at farmertofarmerpodcast.com. Also, I'd ask that you head on over to iTunes and leave us a review if you enjoy the show or talk to us in the show notes or tell your friends on Facebook. We're at Purple Pitchfork on Facebook. And hey, when you talk to our sponsors, please let them know how much you appreciate their support of a resource you value. Don't forget, like I mentioned earlier in the show, you can support the show by going to farmertofarmerpodcast.com slash donate. I'm working to make the best farming podcast in the world, and you can help. Finally, please let me know who you would like to hear from on the show through the suggestions form at farmertofarmerpodcast.com. I'll do my best to get them on the show. And while I've known the Spickermans for some time, they're here today because you asked. Thank you for listening. Be safe out there and keep the tractor running.